Welcome to the second hour of Turning Hard Times into Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor. Well, I'm really pleased to have with me once again Dr. Peter Treadway. Uh, Dr. Treadway is an independent consultant and money manager and has served as an adjunct professor in Asia. Uh, he is currently a principal of Historical Analytics, LLC. That's a consulting investment management firm dedicated to global portfolio management. And its investment approach is based on Dr. Treadway's Wall Street experience. And he uh, has been around for quite a few years. He also has an excellent uh, track record and has uh, been considered a top analyst and, and top money manager uh, by the Institutional Investor Magazine um, over the years. So. Uh, we're really pleased to have Dr. Treadway uh, with us again. Thanks for joining me. Well, it's good to be here. It's good to have you with me. Now, uh, truth be told, of course, uh, you are in Hong Kong and I'm in New York. Um, and we're talking here on Monday morning uh, at 10 o'clock uh, in New York. It's 10 o'clock p.m. there. What can you tell us about uh, the goings-on with the Occupy movement, the student uh, protest in Hong Kong? Have things settled down a bit? Things have settled down. Uh, I think the sort of peak was reached about uh, two nights ago, and um, the um, it's it's become very clear that the government is going to isn't going to give in on anything. Uh -huh. um, number one, number two, um, you have to be familiar with Hong Kong, but there are several areas that they occupied here. They picked one in particular called Mong Kok, which is a giant mistake from their point of view, because they found out in a hurry that the people there are all merchants and triads. There's a lot uh -huh. of triads. Uh, the triads, by the way, are not Beijing connected. They're just local triads, and and um, they hate the uh, protest movement. Uh -huh. And they have there have been considerable pushback, not just there, but all over Hong Kong, but especially in Mong Kok towards uh, the protesters. And um, so I think it's been a little bit of a psychological shock uh, after the, they managed to get hundreds of thousands of mostly students out on the street. It really it took everybody by surprise. And it really seemed like the Chinese troops were going to have to come in to because they only have 28,000 Hong Kong police. Mm -hmm. But um, it didn't happen, partly because you know, uh, in the U.S., I think 100,000 demonstrators would require the National Guard, mm -hmm. uh, whereas here the people are a little bit, in, including the protesters, are more, less aggressive. They, mm -hmm. they were, they really didn't attack the police very much. Mm -hmm. And um, so we, we kind of got through it and... Um, the and then the people started turning against them. They're missing their their work. They're missing their you know their taxi cab drivers today. It's it's, it's on and on. The yeah. students I think were shocked that um, not everybody supported them. And <laughs> you know despite the fact what you hear, I just watched a BBC presentation which I think was completely distorted. Uh, but you know it's not some Beijing directed thugs that are are. Maybe some local thugs in in some cases, but um, the majority of the people of Hong Kong, you know, Hong Kong's business is business. I hate to embark. Yeah. that's Cal Coolidge's uh, old line. But um, and they are really interrupting the businesses. Now, there's something that most Americans wouldn't understand, but Hong Kong has a constitution here that was worked out between the Chinese and the British. Uh -huh. uh, it, it actually was published in 1990. There was an Anglo-Sino-British declaration in, 18, in 1984. Believe it or not, Article 45 of the Basic Law states that there's supposed to be a committee that uh, essentially nominates the um, candidates for chief executive. Mm -hmm. Now, the students want no committee. They, they just want sort of an American or, you know, totally free system. Mm -hmm. the, but that's not what the basic law says. Mm -hmm. That's not what was agreed with. And the, believe it or not, I hate I've never been on the side of the Beijing before, but the the Beijing and the Communist Party are living up to the agreement and the students are not. Yeah. I mean, the students are asking for much more. And it's in the agreement. Now, you can read Article 45. The British, they left some things out. There's some, it's obvious the British and the Chinese maybe didn't agree on everything. But 
but basically the Chinese are are in conformity with the um, with the British agreement with the uh, with the basic law is mm-hmm. what, it, what it's what it's called and so that isn't brought out too much but yeah. uh, and they've sort of had there were rumors of um, uh, Chinese um, troops which are in the city uh, coming out but uh, they never happened yeah it and, wasn't um, it, 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 so it wasn't necessary Essentially, it wasn't necessary at, at this you know, point in time, at least. There was a big least. worry that that was going to have to happen. How do you control hundreds of thousands yeah. of people? Mm-hmm. Um, and that would have really undermined. That's why I had my title a little. It's a little bit heavy now as I look back, but uh-huh. um, that's why people were really were really worried. But uh, one person put it to me today. Uh, she said, um, "You you think that." The Hong Kong students would want to die uh, fighting Chinese tanks. You're wrong. Then they don't want to die before they get their iPhone six. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you. I mean, the students. Uh, I guess probably these students, you know, haven't, as most students, have not yet faced reality, and you know what it means to be an adult and earning a living. They're probably living off their parents to a certain extent uh and totally. so totally not to a certain extent totally totally and, so so and, we're and they're like seven the leaders are like 17 and 18 i think yeah on the, on the student side think about it yeah 17 and 18 right so they haven't really understood and so they were shocked by these merchants and the uh the middle class folks that are just really angered by this disruption of their lifestyle of their uh, their ability to conduct work and and carry on and support their families and so forth. Absolutely. So can, and yeah. what they forget is they have the best deal in China. Remember, the the British, without anybody objecting, handed over this thriving colony of Hong Kong to a communist country mm-hmm. that nobody was asked here. There were no elections, nothing. They just right. handed them over. And Hong Kong has complete freedom um, in terms of everything, the, the Internet, press, um, capital flows, uh, everything. You go to China, you can't get you can't get half the internet sites now. They're mm-hmm. they're all blocked. They're yeah. not blocked here. Mm-hmm. Um, China's not a free place, but the Chinese have lived up with a few little little slips here and there, but have have lived up to the basic law, and they have a good deal. A friend of mine was here last year. He said to me he has a lot of experience in Latin America. And he, but he'd never been to Asia before. He said, you know, this is a beautiful city, but these people are living in a dream world. They, it, they think they're in London or Paris or New York. They're not. They're mm-hmm. in a communist country. Uh, <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's an amazing um, compromise that the, Deng Xiaoping and Margaret Thatcher worked out. Uh-huh. And the local people here, these students, just they don't have any concept of that. But I think we've gotten through it. I, I, I can't believe we have. I really thought we'd see the troops. No. Oh. Well, that's a good thing if, if we've escaped uh, any, any bloodshed. And, yeah, that's, let's hope so. But, I mean, you just have to wonder why this sort of, I mean, if, you, know, if, if you had struggling masses of poverty-stricken people and, and people who were destitute, you could understand. Then they might, however, be a bit more aggressive. I would imagine. Uh, well, yes, but at the unemployment rate it's officially three percent, but it's that's sort of frictional unemployment. It's zero. I zero. mean, these kids—they'll yeah. all graduate and and they all have a job if they want one. <laughs> so, so Hong Kong is still. Uh, I mean, Hong Kong was for the longest time. I forget it was the Fraser Institute or somebody that does studies on the freest countries in the world. And Hong Kong had long been right at the top, and even after the handoff from British to to Beijing, it was still, uh, still considered are. still considered one of the top, if not the top, most free countries in the world. And as the United States is slipping, I might add. Well, you know, um, that's absolutely correct. Although in the last few years, this sort of global malaise, you know, this Thomas Piketty, the French, you know, mm-hmm. this sort of income inequality. Inequality thesis, which some serious students of the matter who have done the work don't agree with, but um, you know that's crept in here too. Li Ka Shing is the was the I think the richest guy in 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 the territory here. He used to be a hero, now he's a devil. <laughs> so it's uh, you know the there's been a little bit of a shift in public attitudes here, 
simply because they joined the worldwide bandwagon on on mine, um, whining about income distribution. Yeah, uh, it's uh, I, I, yeah. I mean, Piketty's. Uh, I mean, it's total nonsense as far as I'm concerned. That whole notion of of uh, total equality it just isn't going to happen, and uh, nor should it, in my view. But that's another issue. Well, uh, I thought it was very interesting. Amazon says it's the most least read bestseller that they have. Yes. People read the book and then they don't read it. So. Yeah, that's, but anyway, that's an aside. But that has, in, that has crept into the thinking here in yeah. Hong Kong, unfortunately. Well, you just have to wonder. I mean, I have to wonder. Uh, this is sort of a carryover, I guess, from the uh, Occupy Wall Street, Occupy movement. Uh, oh, they, 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 well, the, it's actually the students and Occupy Central, it's called here. And uh-huh. they are a collection of older sort of left-wing types who who sat under the HSBC building and, uh, you know, and they didn't have the same kind of, uh, there weren't as many of them, I think, as Occupy Wall Street. Mm-hmm. But they're, it, yeah, they're, and they're still around. And the yeah. Occupy group is allied with the students. And the mm-hmm. students are basically, they don't really control anything. Uh, you know, when they give orders to their masses, they don't obey. And, mm-hmm. then, and then when they ask one kid, well, well who do you obey? I, we obey social media. He said, very good. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is, I mean, you just have to wonder who's who's sponsoring this, how, who's making it go. I mean, Occupy Wall Street, I, I went down and visited and walked around there a little bit just to check it out and see what it was about when here in New York. And then uh, my wife and I were in Hong Kong a few years ago, and we ran into the Occupy folks there that you just talked about under the HSBC right. building. And, um, you know, you just have to wonder. I mean, I've heard uh, rumors that George Soros, NGOs, and various people behind uh, the movement uh, and, and what they hope to accomplish from it. But let's say that this thing had gotten nasty. And let's thankfully, it looks like it's calmed down and things are, are better. Yeah, but not what, what, it's, it's not over yet. But, you know. No, so what What would, I mean, you're saying it's clear that Hong, that um, Beijing cannot back down. And talk they, well, to us about the issues. Why, why not? Committee. What? Well, first of all, it's as part of the basic law, they're moving towards universal suffrage. Remember, under the British, nobody elected anybody to anything. You mm-hmm. know, the government were all appointed. So now, under universal suffrage, this next step, 2017, they will Hong Kong people will be allowed to elect the chief executive. It uh-huh. doesn't call the governor anymore. So, uh, but the nominating committee, Beijing, I think this is very reasonable. Beijing doesn't want to have some, some somebody who's totally antagonistic to them. So they mm-hmm. want some control over sure. the nomination process. Sure. And, and that is, and and it's a lot. And obviously, they thought about this in 1990 because if you read this, um, the the there, you know, it's a little ambiguously worded. It looked like they had some big fights with the British over this, but I mean, it wound up that there is a uh, a nominating committee in accordance with democratic procedure. That's the way it's put. A broadly representative non- nominating committee, and that's they're basically insisting on a nominating committee. That, uh-huh. that, and there have certain rules. Now, those could be probably be negotiated a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know, it's too late for that. But I, I, I doubt Beijing at this point would give in. But, I mean, maybe for the next time they could, cha- you know, the next election, I think it's five years that, that the chief executive is elected for. You know, the the um, the uh, Article 45 uh, essentially basically uh, – so the ultimate aim is a selection of a chief executive by universal suffrage. But there's no timeline in there. I mean, you know, they could argue that, okay, we're going to do this 30 years from now. Well, there's a 50-year sort of the, – the, the agreement lasts for 50 years, you know, mm-hmm. 1997 to – what is it, uh, 2040? 47. 47. Yeah. 47. 46, so yeah. the, the – um, and that's, by the way, that's one of the important things here is, you know, how is Beijing going to treat Hong Kong at the end of the 37 years to go? I think. Yes, and yes. This is um, important as yeah. to Beijing going to put Hong Kong in the pain in the butt category or they, you know, they, they can make decisions which um, hurt or help Hong Kong. They've actually been, they were supportive of Hong Kong after the Asian crisis. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, so, I really think they they realize the value of this city to them. Shanghai doesn't have, you know, they have capital controls on the Chinese currency. Mm-hmm. Shanghai does not have the British law, which they must know in their heart mm-hmm. of hearts you need for our capital markets to really thrive. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, Hong Kong really has a lot of value to them, but they, they're not going to give up the Chinese Communist Party. It's, you know, if it's a choice between survival of the party yeah. and, and Hong Kong, Hong Kong dies. I yeah. mean, that's simple. And the new uh, Xi Jinping, the new Chinese premier, is not Mr. Nice Guy. I mean, he's, um, he's uh, uh, more... Um, more in the uh, more of an authoritarian than the than the uh, pre- his predecessor. Mm-hmm. They, that's another factor here. He's sure. not going to budge on, sure. On, sure. on anything. And see why Lung, who is the chief executive, uh, you know, is nobody seems to like him here. But uh, he he has to. He can't give in either. Mm-hmm. That they want him. They want him to resign. Mm-hmm. You know, he's not going to resign. Mm-hmm. Well, you would think that um, with 37 years to go, you, you know, if if there's too much opposition from the Hong Kong people, then they're likely to get a, a rougher deal, perhaps at the end of that time frame. Well, that's my view, you and know. you know, the deal under the British. I mean, Margaret Thatcher and Deng Xiaoping signed the uh, joint uh, Sino-British agreement in 1984. That was long before 97, because. People start worrying, you know, like a bank makes a mortgage. It's a thirty-year mortgage, twenty-year mortgage. Yeah. You know, well, what's what kind of law is going to hang, going to be around, you know, at the sure. end of the mortgage? That that uh, Hong Kong, the British felt as though they had to come in and negotiate early on mm-hmm. this because Hong Kong was already having problems, mm-hmm. and that the same problems going to crop up again. Mm-hmm. They really have a good deal here, you know. They. they, they it's not the perfect plan. What's the old Von Clausewitz thing? Don't let the perfect plan be the enemy of the good plan. Yeah. <laughs> and then that's, and that's what yeah. these students have done. I mean, no one's really opposed to what they're asking for in another country and in another place, you yeah. know, <laughs> but yeah. here it's different. Yeah. And, and they're part of communist China and they're the best, well, Macau as well, the best deal in, in, in uh, communist China, mm-hmm. and they actually have more more um, freedom in terms of ele- the electoral process than they had under the British. The, under the British, nobody was elected. Yeah, exactly. Oh, all appointed by the British. So I mean, it's, all every governor was appointed yeah. by the British. Yeah. The British um, now the British will argue that the well anyway they they the British were it was a colonially administrated uh, city and. Yeah. The um, and the time to have had these demonstrations, if they wanted more, was 1996 mm-hmm. or 1990. You know, that's but nobody demonstrated. The Chinese, yeah. they, the people who didn't like it left, and yeah. um, the yeah. um, but they never demonstrated. The horse has long left the barn here. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you know, it's 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 too late, and and uh, I think this has damaged Hong Kong. Uh, even in the long run, this is—it's not—it's not a fatal da- uh, wound, but just think about it. If you were Jack Ma, and this were—if mm-hmm. this had happened a year ago, and you're mm-hmm. trying to decide, he wanted to to list the, why he didn't list here is another another story. But mm-hmm. Alibaba wanted to list in Hong Kong. Do you think he would have wanted to list after all of this? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe so not. I'm yeah. glad I'm in New York. Yeah, <laughs> and, and that's. And I really think that um, Hong Kong, as a as a capital, as a stock market, a global stock market, mm-hmm. they'll still do Chinese, you know, Chinese uh, railroads and pig farms, sort of low tech stuff, and and some of them are big offerings. Uh, they, yeah. they will be done in Hong Kong, but uh, the high tech stuff. Um, there's several reasons now. Uh, China. You know, it went through the catch-up phase. It's a miracle. No country has ever equaled what China has brought. So many people out of poverty, and you know, roads mm-hmm. and apartment. Everything's been built, and that is a you know the sort of state-controlled Confucius Confucian authoritarian system. Mm-hmm. I mean, the Confucian ethic is in the DNA, the maybe the the cultural DNA of Chinese and also Korean and Japanese mm-hmm. societies as well. And it, it stresses obedience 
and it stresses hard work mm -hmm. and it stresses non thinking it does you know it's it's not it's sort of it doesn't encourage thinking outside the box mm -hmm. it, you know everything it's an orderly system and that's the way it's supposed to be sure but now china is moving into where it's a knowledge economy and i think the i think that this um this will hurt China, uh, you know, just as Japan has sort of like slowed down. I mean, there's there's, there's such a, author, you know, the culture, I think, discourages um, innovation. Creativity and innovation, which has come more from the West, and then uh, right. the, and the that, Chinese have been very good at, at taking that innovation and uh, applying it or using it. Oh, well, so uh, far, that's what they've done. It's yeah. Effective. They've right. done Alibaba, you know, all of those companies are mm -hmm. copies of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I know, I know I'm skating on thin ice here, uh, but I have a, in my defense, I have a, uh, uh, a Chinese daughter-in-law and a <laughs> half Chinese. Um, so uh, you know friend, something about the, well, I, something I about the culture. Seen, it's, yes. The, the culture is, you know, I always tease her and her father was, um, uh, 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 head of a university here, so uh -huh. he's not stupid people. I said, but would Steve Jobs have survived in your family? And I, I don't, you know, it's maybe I'm wrong on this. We'll see how this this plays out. But I yeah. think that the Confucian and the new the new uh, Xi Jinping is has you know is bragging about Confucius again. Interestingly, uh, Chairman Mao tried to get rid of Confucian, uh -huh. thinking, but. Um, now you you know this. I think that uh, you know the Chinese miracle, as the prospectus to say the past. Well, how do they word this? The past doesn't necessarily um, predict the future. Mm -hmm. um, the I'm not, by the way, in the camp that China is going to collapse or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But you see su substantial misallocation of capital, which I think Xi Jinping realizes mm -hmm. towards the state-owned firm. Um, but, you know, I just came back from a um, conference in Shenzhen, which is right across mm -hmm. the border. Shenzhen, if you look at Shenzhen, it is unbelievable. All the new buildings, everything is so um, w well done. I've and been there. Yeah. I, I, it's even just two an amazing. years ago, it's yeah. changed. It's, and it was nothing until Deng Xiaoping opened things up. However, you sit down with your personal computer to to get to read uh, Bloomberg and read the Wall Street Journal and read uh, the, the 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 New York Times and, or maybe get your YouTube or mm -hmm. or it's all blocked. Yeah. <laughs> how can you run a country? How can you run a knowledge society like that? Yeah. It's it's um I um, Well, I guess that that would keep that would be uh, along the lines of you're not supposed to be thinking. I mean, you just um it's yeah, in the DNA, yeah. and they've got you know, and the, and the communist w one party state just fits right in with yeah. that thing. Sure, you know, the, the two are merged. I mean, but China people tend to forget, or they don't know. China is not something that started in 1776. Yeah, I mean, the Chinese culture goes back thousands sure. of years, and sure. it's an imperial culture, and it's a culture that did not have any democracy, and it's one that. Um, you know the you know really emphasize the Confucian ethic and uh, mm -hmm. so well I'm wondering well, Peter I'm you, you, sort of wondering if um, you know I mean here's a sort of a, a Western culture that is being merged into Hong through Hong Kong because of our m many decades of of, um, of commerce with uh, the British. And I'm wondering, you know, I mean, there's, there's bound to be conflicts then, though, if you're introducing that sort of thought process, democracy, uh, the idea of having, giving people a choice uh, when it's not really in their DNA, as you say. Uh, and I just have to think, you, you mentioned about how Beijing wants to retain control, and that's understandable. But I just have to wonder if there's not some other interest, perhaps, that doesn't want Beijing to have such complete control. We talked to Stephen uh, Stephen Har Harner, uh, who is a money manager out of Tokyo and writes for Forbes, and he notes that how the United States just simply doesn't want China to have the right to protect their own sea lanes. We will protect the sea lanes for them. I'm just wondering if there might not be some fomentation of, of these issues by some other suspect groups in places well, like Beijing Ukraine. Well, Beijing has accused the United of foreign influences of uh, basically... Uh, 
inspiring the students to. Mm -hmm. um, I could, they may be right about, there may be some instances of that, but I, I really don't see that as a major force. I think the students um, have grown up in this sort of uh, dream world, as my friend uh, put it here, and um, they, um, I, I really see it as a locally based phenomenon. Maybe the United States, I, I don't want to sound naive. I don't, yeah. I don't really, how, how would I know if the United States is covertly uh, sure. funding sure. them? Maybe it is in some way, sure. but it doesn't seem that way to me. Yeah, well, uh, we talk to, um, I guess maybe you have to be careful about uh, alleging things that you're not sure of for sure. But we do have Daniel McAdams of the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity on this show. In fact, he'll be following you. Uh, after this segment, and uh, and you know Daniel is is pretty well attuned to a lot of the NGOs that have been implanted in places like the Ukraine and elsewhere uh, to stir things up. But it's not something that's totally yeah Ukraine. I've read that. I read. I don't know Ukraine. Yeah. I'm here. I'm, yeah, sure, sure. I know when I walk by these demonstrators, and I'm with a Chinese friend, and and some older person comes by and says. F you, go home. <laughs> yeah, I don't think the U.S. wrote those lines. But no, 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 <laughs> no. I'm sure that's right. And um, uh, but the, but the students that are sitting there, one wonders, um, you know, who, if maybe it is a spontaneous uprising. I, I certainly. Would. I think it's spontaneous. Maybe a little a little watering by the U.S. Uh, in some way or another. It's, well, uh, I mean, you know, some Peter... of these NGOs, they 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 have this view of the world, so they they of you know. They could be anyway. Yeah. I... Well, you you mentioned the BBC, and you thought oh. that their their reporting of this whole thing that uh, was thuggery coming out of Beijing. This is the same kind of reports we get in the West about Putin in the Ukraine. Uh, it's always the other country. It's never us. Uh, and the fact that the United States. I mean, if I look around the world, and if I were not an American, and I were worried about one group of people that might be imposing themselves on the rest of the world, it would be NATO and the United States. It wouldn't be Russia right now at this point. In I time would agree with that. It wouldn't be I... Beijing. I'm, I'm not worried about Beijing attacking my shores here in the United States. No. Um, I, I would agree with that. I don't, you know, I'm on the ground here in Hong Kong, and I, I, I sort of feel and see what's going on. Sure. So I, I'm not on the ground in Ukraine. And so, you know, I have read uh, people saying that really it's not Putin is not quite the monster that he's portrayed mm -hmm. and that the U.S. Ha and NATO have done a number of things that would have threatened the U.S. had it been on our border. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I've heard that whole argument, but I, I don't have a um, kind no. of. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me, let's put it that way. Well, neither do I, Peter, and I rely to a certain extent on, on things you read. That's all you can do. You're, in, right. uh, you're there in Hong Kong, which is why I wanted to talk to you today about, about this whole issue of Hong Kong. Uh, now, if we could just, uh, with a few minutes left, ask you what your views are of the Chinese economy now. For the longest time there, we were, after 2008, 2009, depending on China and its great infrastructure projects and spending to lift the world out of, uh, out of recession, and it was doing that for a while. Now we hear reports that things are slowing down quite a bit in China. We hear reports, uh, horror stories, of, of, uh, of empty cities and infrastructure and malinvestment that's occurred as a result of planned economies. Again, this could be a lot of uh, propaganda from our side, uh, I suppose. But what is your take on the Chinese economy now? Can they transition, as we were hearing on Bloomberg this morning, and Thomas Keene and the boys were talking about how China now needs to transition from this infrastructure-led uh, economy to a consumer-based uh, demand side of the economy. What's your take? Is it uh, can Hong can um, can China pull this off? Uh, I think they will do it. They were up until now. It's been a miracle. I think going forward, it's not going to be a miracle, but I don't think it's going to be, they're going to be failures either, but it's going to be, the growth is going to be slower. And it isn't just consumer, it's knowledge, you know, they're moving to a knowledge economy uh -huh. and, and uh, they're, they're not structured for that. And, um, but still, the Chinese people, um, one of the things that really strikes me is you travel around Southeast Asia and different places, so many Chinese tourists there everywhere. Mm -hmm. So that's one, one area I actually personally invest in. Uh, in a, uh, well, I, can, I guess I can mention a name, the secret, sure. uh, which is uh, Chinese uh, 
uh, travel company, online travel company. What, what is the uh, name of it again, Peter? C-Trip? C-Trip, C-T-R-P, symbol. Mm-hmm. They're all in New York. They all mm-hmm. traded in New York. Mm-hmm. So, and that will continue, I think. Uh-huh. Um, you know, so you want to stay away from the, you want to stay away from the Chinese uh, state companies. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, uh, by the way, there's a linkage between the Shanghai Exchange and Hong Kong, which is coming up. It was heralded as a big deal. It's been overshadowed by this these demonstrations now, but uh-huh. I think that um, it, uh, it it still is a plus for Hong for Hong Kong stocks in the long run. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the the best Chinese companies trade in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And so are they're, there, are, they're mostly, are there, they're all tech companies. And as you say, they're all copies of U.S. tech companies, but they have a, uh, a market of 1.3 billion people. Uh huh. Sure. No, absolutely. Well, are there any others you'd like to mention? Uh, names? Well, I mean, there's, you know, Alibaba, I think, is going to be a good investment. In the uh-huh. home, though I haven't, you know, I didn't get any allocations uh-huh. which people who did got a Christmas present yeah um, I think there are other companies like uh, Chihu which is a, um, uh, a, a, a and Baidu uh, uh-huh. which, you have the big three which is Tencent I think Tencent is kind of in unfortunately it trade that's a tech company that trades in Hong Kong and they they'd be better off if they didn't but Tencent um, it's the name of the company yeah, Tencent, and the Hong Kong symbol is 700. Uh, uh-huh. I don't know. If it trades uh, over here as an ADR. Well, it does. It yeah. does. Level one. Uh, I don't know the symbol. Level okay. one. Well, that's symbol. that's good enough. People can look it up. That's that's excellent. So I mean, try- you want to be in their, their copycat tech sector. Which okay. Is catering <laughs> to consumers uh-huh. and, and businesses. You know, non-political. Uh-huh. You know, I'm Very good. I mean, I'm nervous, actually, about Tencent because I have something called uh, WeChat, which is being censored by the government, it's a uh, you know social media. Uh-huh. Whereas Alibaba is not in, it's, at least at the moment, uh, in any um, se- any serious political territory. Mm-hmm. So the long and short of it, I mean, Chinese was growing. The Chinese economy is growing so rapidly; uh, it's n- not going to continue to grow at double digits like it was for a while. There, what do you I don't see? Think so. Three, four, five percent, six percent, seven percent. What? Yeah, three, four, five, like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Uh, not well, three. Uh, you know, more four, four or five. On a much bigger base than they were a few a, a decade Absolutely, ago. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But they're moving on to you know things that their system is not really uh, set up for. The Confucian authoritarian mm-hmm. communist system is not. It doesn't work as well for. Mm-hmm. They do a number of things which bother me. For example, um, uh, if you want to buy luxury goods, you can buy them in Hong Kong without any tariffs. Okay? Sure. But in, in China, they have like 40% tariffs on Louis Vuitton and stuff like that. I, I just don't know why. Uh-huh. They, they, they don't need it. But um, You wonder how much they sell with those tariffs and how people well, come across I mean, the border to Hong Kong. You see, that's another thing, by the way, back to the... the, the some of the foreign media said that you know that they they interviewed the Chinese tourists in Hong Kong, and this was supposed to be a big week because it's a golden week in China, and of course a lot of them didn't come. But they expected them to say, "Oh, we're seeing free a free this is freedom we don't have in our own country." This is uh-huh. the kind of quotes they wanted, and what they got was, "We really hate these protesters. We <laughs> came here to go shopping in the store. We can't yeah. get to the store." I mean, that's what the. <laughs> Oh. Well, it's, uh, you know, I guess people just want to be left alone to live their own lives and take care of their own families. And if they have that, they're they're happy about it. And Well, that's uh, been the deal in China. You can do what you want uh, commercially. Just don't mess with the party politically. Yeah, uh, yeah. Now there's, but the trouble is the border sometimes between the two is a little... Yeah. And then you have all the state-owned corporations, which uh, really take—they really take a lot of capital. And, and sure. the, you know, in the 2008 uh, expansion, a lot of money went into um, uh, to those companies and into infrastructure projects locally that really didn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. And, 
Uh, mm -hmm. It's just amazing, though, how, you know, I see them come across the border. Somebody's got money over there. <laughs> it's yeah, so I, I remember uh, walking across the border there uh, from uh, Shenzhen into Hong Kong. And, um, yeah, it was incredible, the crowds. It was just unbelievable. And I can't remember what time of the day. It was on a Saturday or sometime, I believe. And it was just uh, it was just uh, almost frightening, the number of people. It's it's pretty incredible. Well, well that's uh, created resentment here too. The, the people in people in Hong Kong are a little spoiled, and they complain yeah. that Chinese tourists, uh, uh, you know, you, mm -hmm. you can see the mainland tourists uh, if you get on the MTR and you see uh, people with suitcases. The yeah. Chinese people with suitcases are generally mainland tourists. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. One more thing, Peter, before I let you go. Um, I, follow, as you know, focus a lot on gold and uh, monetary systems and so forth. But uh, we have this BRIC phenomenon and the, the BRIC countries coming together and, and looking to s establish some sort of a, a financial infrastructure to compete with the right. what I call the Anglo-American empire. The Anglo-American post-World War II structure, Bre Bretton Woods and the, uh, and the aftermath. Um, how seriously do you take it? Do you, do you think this is Not something? Not seriously at all. No. I think it's a, I think it's a complete uh, mistake. Uh, uh -huh. It may never come to fruition. And while they're at it, they should close the World Bank as well. That was the Bank for International was a reconstruction. It was designed to help Europe mm -hmm. and just continue. They, I think they could make some nice condos out of the World Bank building <laughs> in Washington. And they're just not, you know, all these development banks are always, you know, they're overstaffed. And uh, What about uh, the IMF? Well, the IMF performs certain monetary functions. Um, I'm not sure I'm a great fan of it, but I, I'm the World Bank's a no-brainer. I would mm -hmm. just get rid of it. Mm -hmm. But um, And this other development bank that they cooked up, uh, it does, you know... The shortage of capital is not really, you know, if uh, I think and also I think there's no such thing as a brick. Mm -hmm. You know, what does India have in common with uh, Brazil? Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. it, you know, in China, you know, they're all and China and India are really completely, completely the cultures are just so totally different. They're yeah, just for sure, to be in Asia, for sure, they're, they're really different. And sure. by the way, the Indians. Uh, you see, I'm amazed at the success of Indian uh, entrepreneurs uh, and CEOs, both in India and in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Where we're seeing the Indians, well, Microsoft, the latest example. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the Indians seem to, the top Indians seem to be really good. And you have global firms in India, and this is despite the fact that the Indian market is pathetic compared to the Chinese market. Right. It, but, you know, you have the IT firms and uh, some of the um, uh, health uh, in the health area. The, the Indians have uh, uh, really, but the Indians, unlike the Chinese, the Indians can't build a road yeah. <laughs> or a toilet. Yeah. Well, that's true. I, I do see, though, the. Uh, it seems to me, though, that there is a growing uh, trade between Russia and China, perhaps, though, among well, those countries. Well, that makes sense. I mean, yeah. I, you don't have to you know, uh, be a professional economist, uh, you know, the U.S. trades with uh, Canada and Mexico, those are big numbers for the yeah, U.S., sure. correct? So Absolutely. why shouldn't China, these are neighbors, yeah. um, instead of having wars with one another, trading is, yeah. it, you don't, it's a, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, it's it's much healthier, for sure. Uh, much more constructive to trade than to, to, than to wage war, but I, it seems as though wars continue to be a, an aspect of the human condition, so I don't know. Um, I guess uh, I would like to ask you, though, one more thing, Peter, before we uh, conclude our discussion today, and that is uh, more of a macro, global macro question on um, uh, on tapering. And, you know, can the Fed pull it off uh, and... Do you expect they're in the process of doing it, or do you think they're going to find it very, very difficult and have to start um, hitting the accelerator again? Well, I think the – the um, I'm not sure that any of this survives any serious economic analysis, and I haven't worked on this lately, but um, – the what's important to me is government spending. How they finance it is less important in the short run, uh -huh. and the government spending is affected by the the uh, 
tapering. And you can look at Japan where they put in QE and then the interest rates rose, but then they came back down. And in the U.S., it seems like somebody coming from outer space would say it seems like it almost doesn't make any difference. Mm -hmm. We're in a period of a tendency towards deflation. Mm -hmm. And that's there's still a huge debt overhang uh, around the world, mm -hmm. uh, there's there's productivity increases from technology and globalization. The the we're seeing this gold prices. I mean, what have they done? They they keep finding new bottoms. Uh, and Bitcoin apparently has uh, also dropped uh, dramatically. So I'm not. Uh, you know, I think this tapering stuff is over overrated. And um, the the money was sort of piling up as reserves in the bank, uh, yeah. doing nothing. So. Yeah. Uh, I'm. I don't know. I know that on a short-term basis, meaning week to week, the market really reacts to this. But I, in the long run, does it? I mean, the U.S., the Japanese uh, and U.S. interest rates are. Just, what Japanese interest? I had looked a week ago. There, what's the ten years? About fifty basis points. Yeah, it's uh, something way I low. Mean, yeah. And the Japanese ratios for you know debt and everything are off the charts, and. Um, the U.S. has, since we introduced all this, the the latest QE program going back a year or two, the, I don't think the long rates really have done. They go up, they go down. They seem, to me, unrelated. <laughs>